say is that you are prevented from extracting value that is leakage from the target from the date of the logbox accounts to completion. So I'm saying that, you know, even if it's taking six uh, months, you will not do any expenditure which is out of the ordinary. So it's not like, you know, that between these six months, you will go ahead and, you know, in order to extract money from the company, uh, you know, I'm because I'm paying you 100 crores given the current condition of the company, but you can't be doing in the past six months that you go and you triple the salary of all your employees or your key manager management or your own salary in the company you've tripled for the past six months, you know, in order to extract more money out because we're already paying you 100 crores based on the previous accounts. So that's not how it works. Everything based on the assumption that you run everything in ordinary course of business, as things have been run in the past, with normal business practice, you run these things for the next six months. And in case there is any ex profit extraction or any out of uh, ordinary course transaction that you're taking place or any value extraction that you're doing. You know, it's possible that I'm selling this company. It's on a lockbox account basis 31st March 2021. And what I've started doing is that I've, you know, brought one relative of mine as this company and I've started buying their products, their raw materials for manufacturing at, you know, an exorbitant price. So any value extraction or something that I'm trying to do, that is will be called a leakage. And then what happens is that once I buy the company and I'll do an accounting of the company and I figure out that anything of this sort was done, any value extraction like this was done from the company, which is in deviation from the ordinary course, and you've taken extra money, if you've tried to extract extra money out of the company, then I will have an indemnity right under the agreement. An indemnity right basically means that I have a right to take money from you for the loss that I have incurred. So I will say that, okay, listen, that during these past six months, you've made this extra 10 crore payment to a relative of yours, which has nothing to do with the business. And we could have easily gotten this for one crore from someone else. So this nine crore loss that is to the business, you have to pay that money to me. So it's my ability to recover that loss to the extent of the leakage. This is what happens in a lockbox mechanism. But some people, they don't want to wait till after they've bought the company and they want to do a purchase price adjustment. So what at that time happens is that at the time of closing, then closing means, so there are two concepts and two terms that you'll hear a lot. So there is signing and closing. Signing is obviously the execution of the documents, the date, the date and the, when all the documents are executed by the parties. Closing is when you actually put in the money and you end up buying the company. So that is the date when the shares are transferred and everything happens and you, you're paying the money. So the date you pay the money is the closing date or the completion date. So you will make tell the company that as of say 10 days before completion, the company will give you the latest uh, financial statement of the company, whatever do you think is their estimated financial statement which the company has made. Then you get one of your financial teams to verify those accounts over the next five, six days. And based on any deviation that is there from the previous accounts that you had, you, ex you reduce the purchase price accordingly, or there is a post adjustment, a uh, post closing adjustment, wherein if you've already bought the company and after buying the company, you get one of your financial teams or any CA, a, a chartered accountant to do a valuation and check the finances of the company. And if there is any deviation, then that time you ask uh, you uh, them to repay you that amount back. So the, in completion accounts, the price calculation is based on the assumption that the target has ag agreed net assets on a cash free debt free basis and agreed working capital. So obviously the idea is that company in order to survive requires say given in the past five years, how the business runs, I know that at any point of time, this company requires around five crores in its bank account as working capital to meet its monthly expenditures. That's all it requires. But now that I've bought the company, I realize that this working capital now is seven crores or eight crores, so which is not in line with what was previously agreed and told to me as a normalized working capital. So then that excess amount is what I will adjust as a purchase price adjustment. Upon completion, the actual net assets and working capital are ascertained and the completion accounts are prepared and the price is adjusted in accordance with the completion accounts. So in the completion accounts, we just, you know, uh, say that uh, the estimate was that you have a debt of zero rupees. Now I am seeing that you have a debt of hundred rupees. 
So this hundred, which extra amount debt, which I have to pay is something that I'll take from you. And that has to be adjusted from the purchase price. Similarly, the working capital has increased than it was that what was estimated, it, uh, what was the estimate. This excess working capital is again something which I need to adjust from the purchase price. So this is just, you know, lockbox versus completion accounts as a concept. <laughs> what is working capital? Like I said, in an ordinary layman term, it is the amount of money that I'll need for my day to day, you know, uh, working of the company. It's the time of evaluation business. The buyer will evaluate a normal level of working capital for the target. That is the level of working capital to sustain a normal level of operational activity. So to maintain the day to day operations of the company, I figured out that we need around five crore monthly to maintain the day to day operations to pay everybody's salaries, to buy the raw materials, or to you know pay for the licenses that I have, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the normal working capital that I require. And what is that? How and what is the working and when do you get working capital? It's current asset versus, uh, minus current liabilities. Obviously, that after you've paid everything, what is the money that you have in the company that is required to meet your expenditures? Current assets are nothing, your stocks, trade debtors, accrued interest and prepayments, your debtors, including sale of capital assets and obviously cash, but it is treated separately. Your current liabilities include your trade debtors, payment on account and other creditors and accruals. These are mostly financial terms, but you basically just need to give an idea when you're reviewing a document that your uh, current, your working capital will be your current assets minus current liabilities. Finally, adjustments basis everything which is done when you're doing an adjustment, your price is adjusted as follows. Enterprise value is the value of the business irrespective of how it is financed. Like we discussed, you adjust that for any cash or debt in the target company. So that amount gets subtracted. You adjust for the working capital, whatever deviation in working capital that we saw that was there from the normal level of working capital that is adjusted. And typically when we are making an offer letter or a term sheet, we always say that the price of the company is X on a cash free debt free basis, assuming normal working capital and capex in line with the budget, right? So normal working capital and capital expenditure in line with the budget. So you will have a company has a budget that, you know, that over the next year we'll be spending not more than 10 crores and these are the expenditures that we have planned. And this is the normal day to day expenditure that we have. So in case there is anything which is in excess of that, then obviously we adjust it from the purchase price. <clears throat> you have to make sure that the idea is that the seller does not extract profits out of the company. Generally sellers, what they do is that before they're selling off the company, all the profits or the cash that is there in the company, they try to extract it by declaring dividends to themselves or finding any other mechanism. Like I was saying that, you know, increasing the salary of your relatives, giving a related, you know, con entering into contracts with your related parties and, you know, uh, and paying them money, which is not at arm's length, paying them some exorbitant money just to extract money out of the business before selling it off. So these are things you need to be look out for. And that is why we do completion accounts. And, you know, we have a lockbox system to make sure that there's no leakage and there's no extraction or undue extraction of profits. <clears throat> and during the closing accounts, we actually calculate the actual equity value of the company minus all the debt that the company has taken and either the seller or the purchaser can prepare the closing accounts. I mean, so anybody of them can hire a chartered accountancy firm to get that prepared. And then the other has the right to um, actually dispute it if they think that's not correct. So you go to the next price adjustments, completion accounts we've discussed adjustments can result in payment from the seller or the buyer or vice versa, because if it's, I'm doing a post closing adjustment where I've already paid you the money. And then I figure out that, you know, the money I've paid you is excessive because you had done some, you know, uh, there was been a change as part of the closing accounts. So I can ask you to repay me the excess amount, which I had paid to you. And similarly, if after the closing amount, it comes out that, you know, we had assumed this value basis, a debt of 100 rupees, but actually the debt has been reduced to 50 rupees, then that excessive amount is what I have to additionally pay to you. <clears throat> Adjustments are typically an amount of cash, financial debt and capex. That is fine. What a lot of times uh, we do is that uh, in order to figure out what they see because some of these are hidden expenses and once i'm buying the company maybe one month two months or three months down the line i may come to know that you did something and because of which some excessive loss happened or there was some problem because of what you did what we try to do is that um, we uh, as buyers sometimes have a escrow account an escrow account is nothing but a temporary account where we park the money 
and I will tell you that what I'm doing is that I am paying you instead of 100 crores, I'm paying you 90 crores right now. 10 crores I'm keeping back in escrow for any contingent liabilities that may come up once I've bought the company. So let me give me a time period of three months to do my closing accounts, to figure out everything, to see what all is there and what all is not there. <clears throat> and then after that, if I feel that there is nothing, then I will pay that hundred, uh, that 10 crores to you. But if there is any loss that I see at that time, I will extract money from there and only pay you the balance. What that escrow amount does is that it provides a kind of security. It provides a security net to the buyer because otherwise I will have to sue you for indemnity, come after you. You may give me the money. You may take time to give the money. You may claim that you don't have the money to pay to me or whatever it is. So that escrow amount gives me a safety net because I've already uh, deposited the amount in the escrow account. Right. Then after that, deductions are made in case of warranties are breached again, because in case so escrow amounts also help that holdback amount that if there is a breach of warranty during that period or any loss because of that, I can easily extract the money from the end of the indemnity from the escrow amount. And then at the end of the escrow term, I only pay you the balance amount on outs. Sometimes what we do is that how we structure the transaction is that we do an earn out based model. Now, what is that earn out based model? One of the things is that I'll tell them that, okay, a lot of this valuation, which is coming is from the facts that you're telling me that the company is going to do very well over the next five years. I think we discussed this brief, uh, briefly yesterday as well, that, you know, a lot of this valuation that you're giving me and these figures that you're throwing at me, they are coming from the fact that the company will achieve these figures over the next five years. You are running the company. You've been running the company for the past five years and you have a belief that if you keep running it for the next five years, we can achieve these targets. So fair enough. What I'm paying you right now. So you, you are valuing your company at 150 crores. I think this is what we have right now. I can pay you a hundred crores and the balance 50 crores. I can pay you 10 crore every year as a, a bonus as an earn out based on you achieving these targets. So you keep, so you keep on working with me as an employee, sign an employment agreement with the company and as a earn out bonus every year, if the company achieves this target, I will keep on paying you an additional 10 crores. So we structure it like a uh, earn out also. And these are milestones to be specifically agreed that based on what, uh, you know, milestone or what target you achieve, do you, I actually pay you the earn out. And the regulatory climate is obviously sometimes for these earnouts, you may require an RBI approval. So you just need to see what type, how do you structure uh, the earnout? Now, when we this concept is done, basically these are just terms that you may, uh, you know, you will require. Actually, not may, you will require <coughs> when you are drafting. So now, finally, what? How do we draft the SPA? Now, SPA. We'll discuss the skeleton of the SPA right now as a brief overview, what all are the clauses in the SPA. We'll discuss the importance of conditions precedent. We'll consider uh, discuss what are the MAC clauses. MAC is the material adverse consequence or a material adverse uh, event, uh, you know, clauses which are there. Uh, so what is their importance in an SPA? Interim period undertakings is what we'll also discuss. Interim period undertakings are the undertakings between signing and closing. Because see if a transaction takes place and I've put a lot of conditions precedent for you to fulfill and it will take you three months time to fulfill those conditions precedent. Maybe we require an RBI approval to close the transaction. So you will take three months to close it. So I should have some rights in the company for those three months so that nothing out of the ordinary takes place in that company during that interim period. Because again, I've done my diligence. I've done everything basis the, uh, till the date I'm signing the document. So if you're doing anything out of the ordinary <clears throat> between signing and closing, taking any loan, hiring any new person or doing whatever it is, you will require my uh, consent. So these are interim period obligations, which we will discuss. Obviously, indemnities and warranties, how do they interplay with each other and how is the risk allocation done? What are the general typical post completion undertakings that are there in an SPA? Price and valuation, which we've already discussed, right? And then we'll just, I'll just briefly give you a skeleton of how to draft an SHA. So the next slide, this is the SPA skeleton. <clears throat> Generally, this is how your SPA will look. You will firstly have the definitions clause. 
So how does it contract generally work? When you see any contract, at the first clause, it will be the parties clause that A, so you know this contract is entered into on this date between A party and B party. So the parties to the contract. Then you have the certain recitals which are there, which say that you know that uh, say this company uh, is in the business of this. The sellers own the entire share capital and all the shares of the company as on this date, and these are the shareholders whose names are given in the agreement. Then the buyer is desirous of purchasing these docu- uh, the shares from the sellers, and accordingly you are entering into a transaction. These introductory paragraphs are there. Then the main body of the SPA. Firstly, you will have your definitions and your interpretations. Now, why are these definitions and interpretations very important? Because when you are actually looking at a document, a lot of times these definitions, these are the capitalized terms that you used, and that you use in the document. It becomes very important from an interpretation of the document perspective. Now, what we as lawyers do is that we, you know, that's where all the legal work comes in. How we are defining uh, all these words. Because a term which is not defined is left to interpretation of court. So then it is up to if you've not defined a proper, you know, if you're using a term, say even if you're using a term like uh, encumbrance or indebtedness, and it is not defined in your document, tomorrow when it is goes to a court of law, you can actually claim that you know this this particular transaction that is there, that you know this person had just an oral claim against me and nothing like that. That cannot be construed as indebtedness, and you can't say that I did a fraud by not disclosing it. So just that there's no ambiguity going forward. we define everything we have these proper definitions you know which cover everything under the sun for every word things like liability things like uh, indebtedness even a loss you know a loss definition is something which is highly negotiated when we are defining the word loss that what is the loss uh, you know what does loss mean when used in this agreement because you know some people want to limit it only to direct loss so it will say that you know a loss means any direct an actual loss incurred by the seller or the buyer pursuant to this transaction you know because you don't you want to exclude out all the indirect consequential or you know uh, consequential losses or, and things like that so you have to define the words properly so you have to look at the definitions to see if things are tying in or not has you know somebody tried to be very creative as a lawyer and used terms uh, in these definitions which are uh, not good for you as a buyer so you have to look out and especially as a seller you need to make sure that the buyer has not put in some terms which are not beneficial for you because the buyers will generally have the you know buyers legal counsel will generally have the tendency of making these exorbitant you know catch all definitions which cover everything so you need to trim them down and make that you know uh, what is palatable to your client interpretation clause also becomes very important because you know interpretation clause we write things like time is of the essence wherever there is you know a time period you have to make sure that things are delivered so because sometimes i say that you please deliver a document to me within 3 days of uh, the receipt of you coming uh, of your knowledge but then you know in interpretation clause i'll clarify saying that anything which has to be done on a particular date under this agreement has to be done by 6 pm ist on a working day just to give you clarity so that tomorrow you know your office people have gone and then somebody comes and delivers a notice to you it should not be it should not count as a day so you say that within working hours if something is delivered to me we will consider it to mean that it has been delivered on that day as per the agreement so you have to put an interpretation clause over there as well then your spa will set out the purchase and or subscription of instruments what all is being bought so you will have a uh, clause which will say purchase such uh, subscription of instruments that the buyer is buying x number of shares from the seller at this price you know on this closing date etc etc and on this date the buyer will transfer the money from his or her account to you at this price so you have a purchase of subscription which sets out how many shares are you are buying or subscribing to and at what price then your spa will have the conditions precedent the conditions precedent are again which will something which we will discuss uh, in more detail but like i discussed those are conditions or conditionalities without uh, which you will not proceed with the transaction so those need to be uh, completed for in order for you to be able to go ahead with the transaction the buyer says to the seller that you do these 10 things get everything get your house in order and once that is there i will proceed with buying the company closing clause the closing clause will set out that as on the closing date that is the date on and buying the company these are the actions which are required to be taken by the company 
what will these actions be so firstly from the buyer's obligation will be obviously to pump in the money to send the transfer the money the seller's obligation will be a to hand over the original share certificates to you to make sure that the company has passed all the proper board resolutions to take on account the transfer of the shares to make sure that the share transfer form that they're doing is properly executed and properly stamped that they're giving to you if you are buying the company you will obviously want to change the board of directors of the company so it will be an obligation on them to have a board meeting and replace the board of the company and replace their members uh, with your nominees on the board or uh, then it will be an obligation on the sellers that obviously because you are buying the company the company would have issued a lot of power of attorneys or given a lot of rights to the people who are to its own employees or the promoters who were previously there so you have a resolution saying that all the previous authorizations all the previous power of attorneys which are issued by the company hereby stand revoked and hereby stand cancelled and new uh, authorizations are issued in favor of the new directors who are being uh, appointed so the closing will set out the entire mechanism that needs to be followed on the closing date then interim and post completion undertakings again these are something which we'll discuss in detail right now <clears throat> as we progress but generally like i told you it is the interim uh, obligations between signing and closing that are need to be uh, done so you set those out and then you have a clause where you set out the post closing obligation saying that okay now we've um, done the uh, closing of the transaction but those conditions subsequent that we had which we previously discussed these are the post closing covenants that you need to adhere to reps and warranties are form a very important part of how we negotiate the spa and on the spa because these are again statements basis which you're buying the company they are telling me that there are no debts they are telling me that other than the 10 debts that i have disclosed in the disclosure letter there is not no 11th debt which is there there is no 11th loan which is there other than those five uh, you know uh, cases which i have disclosed in the disclosure letter there is no other case which is pending or threatened against me then you know a representation and warranty saying that i own all the shares of the company and that no i have not entered into any contract with any other person which says that you know they have a right to my shares things like that so these are the statements basis which you are buying the company so those have to be properly drafted in the spa and if there is a breach of any of those uh statements which are there then comes our next thing which is indemnities that you have a right to indemnity because obviously i am buying the company thinking that this company only has the five loans which you have disclosed in the disclosure letter but if tomorrow there is a sixth loan which comes up and somebody files a case against us for recovery of that money i should have a right to indemnity to come after you because you made a wrong representation to me you made a misrepresentation to me you made a breach of warranty so i should come after you in order to get that money from you so i should be made good for my losses for which i'll come Uh, against you <clears throat> then the exit and or termination so obviously there is a termination clause in the spa which says that if the closing of the transaction does not take place by the long stop date now the long stop date i'll put a date saying that obviously we have a lot of conditions precedents which you need to follow etc etc and okay these are the 10 things which you need to do in order for me to get your house right so that i can buy the company but it's not like i will sit and wait indefinitely for you to rectify them i have given a long stop date of 3 months that you have 3 months to do everything if within those 3 months you are unable to complete all the conditions precedent then this agreement will stand terminated so you have a termination proceeding and then you say that at the time of termination who and what will be the liabilities and how will things work i mean you you will not have any additional liability the buyer will not be obligated to complete the transaction or put in money in the company etc etc miscellaneous clauses also become very important so miscellaneous clauses will be your governing law dispute resolution entire agreement cost notices obviously every agreement that you have will have a governing law clause it will tell you that the law say this okay, this contract is governed by the laws of india and the courts at new delhi with help uh, will have exclusive jurisdiction for example and dispute resolution mostly everybody who's entering into a commercial contract in india they prefer to have an arbitration process set out in the document as opposed to going to court 
and then fighting the case because we know that court cases given the number of cases that are there in the judiciary sometimes they end up taking a lot of time so arbitration is a much more uh, well structured process it it has fast timelines in india as well as abroad if you are if you are choosing a foreign seated arbitration so you would want a proper arbitration clause set out and an arbitration regime set out in your document so as part of the spa the entire agreement clause that miscellaneous clause which is there that will tell you that uh, you know that <clears throat> this is an entire agreement and that this agreement sets out the entire understanding between the parties in relation to the particular subject matter and anything prior to this if we would have discussed orally anything or you know any oral uh, representation of warranty if it's not there in this agreement it's not valid the only valid thing is what i have agreed to and written in this agreement so tomorrow it cannot be the case that you come and tell me that no you know 6 months ago you had told me that in addition to 100 crores if you like my work you will pay me 10 crores extra as well so now pay that money but i would say no that we have an entire agreement clause does the spa say that i am required to pay you 10 more crores if you uh, achieve this milestone no so if that doesn't say then i am not obligated to you because every all our commercial understanding has been written in the spa and that's why we have an entire agreement clause saying that anything outside this is no longer valid cost parties generally need to figure out what are the costs of the transaction and who is going to bear the cost generally you want the seller or the company to bear the you know stamp duty and other transaction expenses and the buyer only bears his or her own or its own uh, legal costs which are there notices clause says that obviously if i want to sue you tomorrow or if i want to send any communication to you obviously i have written clauses and i have written doc- drafts uh, you know sentences saying things like uh, you know that you will inform the seller or you will inform the buyer within 5 days of you, you know something coming to your knowledge but how do what does it mean that i have to inform you how does that happen the notices clause will say that if you have to give any notice to any company then say if you are sending an email to the ceo of that company or you're delivering a letter to the ceo of the company at this address and at this say suppose fax number at this email address etc if you're doing this it will be considered that you delivered a notice to the company so you have to identify who in the company gets is notified for the company to be aware of something because it should not be the case that if tomorrow you've gone and you've delivered something to the guard outside my building and it never reached me you can't claim that you've notified me about this or you i've become aware of it so the proper notices clause which says that who do you have to deliver the document for it to be considered and you know send an email to this address for it to be considered as a notice <clears throat> then you have the schedules which are there to the spa you will have more some more definitions can be there you have the shareholding patterns you know pre closing post closing shareholding pattern so you should i should be knowing that before i buy the shares of the company the company has four shareholders and after we have bought the companies the company will only have these two shareholders with this shareholding so the pre and post closing shareholding patterns are there the restated charter documents uh, you know uh, uh, what to be done know that you know the process to be followed the charter documents of a company are articles of association and moa and more than in an spa this becomes very important in a shareholders agreement because in india what is idea is that uh, for you to enforce something against the company it is important that that uh, those should be entrenched in the articles of association of the company so you need to amend the articles or restate the articles to reflect your commercial understanding on a lot of things so that it becomes enforceable on the company obviously the case law lately has changed and the courts have started giving importance to the contractually agreed shareholders agreement as well and even if it's not entrenched in the articles of association but it's always best as a legal practice to make sure that everything that you agreed to and all these obligations amongst the shareholders does they are reflected in your charter documents now if we go one by one the most important thing like we have discussed as what comes out of our due diligence process is your conditions precedent why do we need them the pros and cons of a uh, precondition precedent the pros of a condition precedent are that obviously everything gets rectified up front i have given these 10 items to you then i you i have told you that these are the things which you need to rectify and as and when if you've rectified these things and given me a proof that you've rectified them and you're buying the company it reduces my risk a lot and obviously it makes sure that i as a prudent buyer have taken all the precautions while buying the company to make sure that it's in compliance with law 
the con can be that you know you identified something which was a major thing and maybe you know as part of the negotiations it gets watered down i wanted you to obtain the license but because of the time limit you negotiated saying that okay i'll just apply for it right now and then once you buy bought the company you can follow up with the authorities to get the license and so you know that's what happens now tomorrow if the uh, licensing authority refuses the license you know the con is that you can easily claim to say that my responsibility was only to apply for it you know not to get you the license and now because you've not been able to get the license it's not my issue but you see for that also that is why it's important for us to then make that as a condition subsequent to say that you know applying is fine that after i but even after i pay you the money you are on the hook to actually get me the uh, application of the license so these are again negotiated terms which are there what does the cp say about the acquirer the cp is obviously so the amount of extensive cps there are or the materiality of the cps will tell you what is the risk appetite of the buyer like i said a lot of times what happens is that these companies the deals are so big the business the business team is under so much pressure from their top management to close these deals that they take materiality calls and they say like i told this recent deal which i had the person told me that sadharth anything less than 100000 i don't care you know it's fine we don't care you know and this is a multi million dollar b and deal it's going to cost you 5 600 million dollars and as compared to that if there's a 100 dollar 100000 dollar penalty i don't care so please only raise issues above that amount to me so if anything below that we can rectify it once we buy the company so a lot of these but a lot of people even for them even if it's such a huge deal they would still want everything to be in order so it tells you about the risk appetite as a buyer as well you know so one of these things which are obviously coming up then uh, traditionally some cps are your competition law uh, cps that does this transaction trigger a competition law filing are related undertakings relevant what is the nature of the business is it a dominant player or not basis that is a uh, you know a filing requirement required with cci then it becomes a condition precedent because without getting the approval of uh, the competition commission of india you won't be able to undertake that transaction and like we discussed yesterday there is a small company exemption so if you're falling that 350 crores and 1000 crore threshold so if you're below that then fair enough then you don't need it but if you're above that then you need to do a competition law analysis then other cps which are traditionally there are the approvals which you require from other regulatory operators if you are in a particular sector if you are in the digital media sector then maybe you require approval from the ministry of information and broadcasting for any change in control of the company if you are an insurance company you require an approval from the irda for any change of control if you are a banking company or an nbfc you require approval from the rbi for any change in control or if it's a foreign investment which is coming and maybe it's in a restricted sector uh, or the type of foreign investment is such that it requires any foreign uh, rbi approval say that the investor is from china or some other uh, restricted country then again you require your governmental approval to be there so then all these approvals become conditions precedent because without these approvals you won't be able to invest in the company then other deal than the deal specific cps deal specific cps so what are traditionally there in most of the transactions is obviously that you will require the board approval you will require shareholders approval and all these other basic corporate approvals which are there those required to be uh, are required to be taken up front right purchaser financing that if the purchaser is required to take a loan from somebody and maybe that lender has some conditions which are required to be inserted in the document those get added as part of the documentation process obviously the things which you identified in the due diligence those as it is become part of the conditions precedent which are there if you've seen that you know any uh, corporate approvals are required from the shareholders of the company or if you realize that the articles of association of the company say that you know that without this process being followed no change of control in the company can happen etc those become part of conditions precedent if you have seen as part of your uh, co- review of the other contracts the major contracts of the company that this you know these cus- particular customers have a change in control consent requirement and the consent from those uh, customers becomes a condition precedent because without which if you uh, you know undergo with the transaction they can terminate the agreement then if any of the lenders through whom you've taken the loan they have that uh, obligation or they have that requirement of a prior consent that becomes very important 
then obviously uh, curing defects arising from due diligence like we said that these are the things i saw i saw that you have not applied for these licenses or i saw that you have not taken uh, these uh, particular approvals beforehand or i've seen that you know that your company is not in compliance with abc laws so these are things i want you to rectify prior to closing so and then you give me evidence for that so then those things also become cps then ultimately your cp clause will also have a long stop date which like we discussed that i obviously i am a patient man and i'm a you know patient woman i'm buying your company and i don't you know i'm ready to give you 3 4 months to get your house in order do everything get all the cps done but then there has to be long stop date to it beyond which i will not be held accountable and i can easily walk away from the deal so uh, without any liability on me so it's very simple that i so join long stop date is 3 months from the date of signing the document and within a date of 3 months from the signing of the documents if you are not able to complete all the conditions precedent then the long stop date hits then i have a right to terminate that's where the termination rights come which says that i have a right to walk away from the transaction in case any of these uh, events are not done the other idea of uh, thing for which we have uh, termination rights is in case of a mac event if a material adverse uh, you know uh, consequence or a material adverse effect event takes place then i have termination rights so that is the next slide which will deal with it the mac clauses right just give me a minute Hmm. So, what are MAC clauses? MAC clauses are material adverse events or material adverse consequences. I have bought this company today, knowing that you know that Indian, that your company is one of the biggest companies in the sector, and uh, you know it's booming a lot, etc., etc. But some circumstance happens after I've signed the document, and between signing and closing, something happens, which is considered a material adverse effect or material adverse event. which changes you know the dynamics of the transaction generally how we define it is how we define a material adverse event is any event circumstance effect occurrence or state of affairs or any combination thereof which is or is reasonably likely to be materially adverse to the business operations assets liabilities properties business or financial condition of the target or any material subject i'll give an example and this is a live example which happened a few months back we were working on a transaction and the buyer who was there was a german buyer they were buying a company which uh, produces wires aluminium wires uh, correct so they were producing wires and they were one of the market leaders and they were doing brilliant business for us for them they signed the deal we did the due diligence everything looked fine after the diligence uh, after the signing of the documents there was a 3 a month period between which they were closing the cp during that time what happened was that one of their sellers and this was the ma- uh, one of the customers and this was the major customer it was a government agency they sent them a notice saying that because they were had to pay them 90 crore rupees they sent a notice to them saying that they are holding back the money that they are supposed to pay to them for these buyers because these buyers which they shared uh, sent them these buyers were not of good quality and now they want to do a quality check of all the buyers that they've supplied to them and till that time they are holding back on the 90 crores and because they fault found faulty buyers they are also terminating the contract which they had with them now this particular customer used to around so out of their revenue of say 100 crores 30 crores was coming from this particular customer as part of their sales now if this one customer terminates the contract uh with the company then the things are not the same which they were previously because previously i was buying a company which has a track record of 100 crore sales per annum but now because everybody has uh, this particular customer has terminated the contract and has blacklisted the company i am set to lose 30 crores per annum as revenue and it may have an effect on other sellers as well so this became a material adverse event in which case the sellers buyer said that i have a right to walk away from the deal 
I don't care even if you complete all the conditions preceded. But because the Mac event has happened, I am walking away from the deal. A Mac event is also highly negotiated. The definition, you know, because we as sellers, you know, obviously seen practice is it varies from case to case. It is highly negotiated, often benchmarked against tangible criteria, and sometimes we go for an expert determination as well. What we would try to obviously uh, remove from a Mac event is something which affects the industry as a whole. Now imagine that if I would say that you know we try and make uh, like in addition to this clause, where I said any event which is, has a material adverse effect or you know any occurrence which has an adverse effect on the business of the company, except such uh, occurrence or su- except such an uh, instance which affects all the companies or all the competitors in my industry. Equally, imagine COVID. So, if I have a clause in general clause, somebody can come and say, "Oh, it's a Mac event." But if my clause is drafted in a way which clearly states that if it is something which is equally hampering everybody in the industry, then it's not a material adverse effect. Then it's just a business risk. So, in which case, then if COVID happens, you cannot come and say it's a Mac event because I'll say it's affected everybody equally. So it's not something which is particularly my fault because of which it has happened. It's a business risk which has happened to the industry as a whole. So you, it's highly negotiated how we end up drafting the MAC clause, and you know a lot of hours are uh, go into discussing this and arguing on this clause. But it varies from case to case. It varies from matter to matter. And yes, sometimes you know you say that you know people say that it's very subjective. If you are saying that it's a Mac event has occurred, who will determine that a Mac event has occurred? So you know there are instances where we put in the clause that we'll go for an expert determination in such a case. You know, go to a third party agency to carry out uh, a check and see whether it's you know a material adverse event or not. So that's also something which is uh, negotiated. But <clears throat> yes, it has to be clear as to what all events can lead to a Mac being there. And uh, it's ideal. Typically, you know, in transactions, we've not seen it being relied upon a lot because the tra- time between signing and closing is short. You go ahead with the transaction, but yeah, the idea does remain mostly that it should be there because, like in our case, we were able to walk away from the transaction because we had a proper MAC clause in place. Otherwise, we would have been obligated to buy a company which was suffering a you know thirty crore loss, which was very different because then we would have valued the company at way less the amount if we knew that this was going to happen. <clears throat> In term period undertakings. Now, like I told you that you I am buying the company today, and the closing you have three months to close the deal. Between I when I will have control over the company and I will have ownership on the company only post closing. When I paid you the money, my directors are sitting on the board. I have all the authorities in place. I own all the shares of the company. I am controlling the company. But between signing to closing, I would want to have visibility on what is happening in the company, and I would want the seller to come to me before taking any important decision in relation to the company. You would want that. Obviously, you are allowed to do things which are uh, in ordinary course of business. That things which are done normally in ordinary course, a day-to-day expenditure. Obviously, monthly you are paying salary to the employees. You continue to pay monthly salaries to the employees. You don't need to take my permission for that. Everything which is happening in accordance with past practices, fair enough. Every month you pay hundred rupees to your raw to procure raw materials. You keep on paying hundred rupees to procure raw materials. I don't have a problem with it. But anything which is not in ordinary course. That is anything which changes the nature of the business, anything which leads to a change in control of the business, anything which increases the costs of the business or is increasing the risks of the business. So, like I said, for the past one year, you've been spending hundred rupees to procure raw materials for the company. All of a sudden, if tomorrow you want to procure raw materials worth one fifty rupees or for two hundred rupees during this interim period, you have to come and take my permission for it. You have to explain to me why do you want to do it, and then you do it. I want that control in the interim period. The pushback on this from the seller side is that you know they want uh, they are saying that you know we need to give you a properly running company, and sometimes there are unexpected costs which come up, uh, you know, so for which we can't come to you all the time. And we say fair enough, very good, all the best, but we still need some type of control, and we can be uh, reasonable about it, but. And we can come back to you in a shorter time period if you come to us uh, for our consent. But we want visibility on this. 
imagine so like you know this became a problem when we were doing one of these deals where we were buying a, a sports club you know so we were uh, we were buying a sports team and that team at the time we said that you know we require there was a, a time period between signing and closing so they said that you know we told them that any expenditure that you incur or any new player that you're getting so you would require our prior consent they said that this is a hindrance to our business because if we are running the season right now and in between season if we need to buy a player and that player sometimes the bidding is so intense that we need to make them an offer overnight for them to accept so i should not be obligated to come to you to take your consent and then make that counter offer over there because then i will lose out on that lucrative player and someone else will do overbid me uh, without it and i'll just be sitting here asking for your permission which might get delayed so then you know we came up with a solution to that that fine that file for everything else we have a period of 4 to 5 days to come back to you if it is something as important as a, buying a player you give us a period of 24 hours if we do not come back to you within 24 hours on that price you can do whatever you want take it as a deemed approval so these are how things went because uh, you know so but things which are considered out of ordinary course of business is what your buyer will want to have control over because you i am buying the companies in 6 months so i should know what you're doing specific items access to right access to regulators hell or high water clauses now access to information access to regulators so if it's a regulated entity say you are a insurance company or regulated by the irda or you are a digital media company and you are regulated you have you have a regular correspondences with the ministry of you know information and broadcasting i would now want that because i'm buying this company in the next 6 months whatever correspondence you have with all these regulators i want access to all that communication all the letters that you write to them please give me a copy of those letters any communication that you receive from the regulators please give me a letter a copy of that communication so that i am get to know what is happening in the company from a regulatory perspective and so that when i am buying the company and stepping into your shoes i am not entering into uh, something unexpected over here access to information obviously a lot of things is there that you know i want information and inspection rights i want to be sure that in the next 6 months if i want i can send one of my employees over to your office and he or she can make us make sure that everything is in order all the books are being maintained properly or if they want to cross check something they can easily come and cross check so you i want an access to information and i want an access inspection rights to come and see hell and high water clauses are again you know things which are out of the blue or out of uh, ordinary which end up happening for which you know sometimes expedited approval may be required like we discussed other issues are working capital management and cash balances again working capital management you've told me that you know that like we discussed that every year every month you don't require more than 5 crores of working capital to run your day to day operations of the company including payment of salary buying of raw materials all your basic electricity expenditures your normal company expenditures which are required for the operation to run this operation uh, operate this company properly you've told me that you require 5 crores i am willing to pay you 5 crores but if it is anything in excess of that you require my permission similarly for cash balances that you know we've always the company has always maintained a cash balance of 50 crores in its bank accounts if today you are planning to give dividends or extract cash through any other way you will require my prior permission for that so these are the some you know basic examples of interim period undertakings which are required to be undertaken then what we were discussing the key concepts which are there when it comes to reps and warranties because reps and warranties are very important and reps and warranties are also highly negotiated and because this is basis this reps and warranties and the indemnities and the limitations of liability that the entire risk allocation of a transaction takes place because risk allocation is that if you buying a company you need to be sure what are you liable for and what are you not liable for this is a problem which has come when i have bought the company but this is not my problem because this is the seller's responsibility so you have to have everything done warranters who is providing the warranty who is who will stand behind these warranties and who will pay money if, if there is a breach of this warranty right so in case of a control transaction if i'm buying a company then i would want the sellers to stand behind it because i am paying the money to the sellers right so some when you're giving me a statement saying that the company does not have any cases against it 
then if this statement is wrong tomorrow who do i come after who do i sue for it so the warranters are people who come after that so for in that case we go behind the sellers who are there what happened once so sometimes what the happens is that some of these sellers they are individuals who themselves don't have that much money but we know that they have companies you know and those companies have a lot of money so we will have a warrantor come we will make one of those huge companies uh, there are companies which we've seen the financials of that company we know it's a very financially sound company we will make that company a warrantor saying that if tomorrow there is a breach in addition to these two people we can also go after that company because the individual can easily tell me that okay i'm bankrupt now sue me for whatever you want and do whatever you want i'm bankrupt i don't have money so you want somebody who has deep enough pockets to actually pay you the money if there is any breach to be the warrantor the new concept nowadays which people are going for or parties are going for is a reps and warranty insurance you go to an insurer and take an reps and warranty insurance from them the sellers will go and sellers will say that it's fine we are taking an insurance the insurance company will look at your due diligence report and the insurance company will tell you a premium we are ready to pay that premium the sellers also want a peace of mind they are ready to pay the premium up front and then if there is any loss that you incur you don't go after the seller you go under the reps and warranty insurance obviously anything which is not covered under the reps and warranty insurance for that you can go to the seller but uh, the idea remains that the primary objective that if there is any loss you go to the insurance company saying that we had they had taken a reps and warranty insurance these were the reps and warranties there is a breach now please pay us and then you deal directly with the insurance company and not the seller so sellers also do this because they also want the peace of mind and they are willing so you know say a multi million dollar transaction or a billion dollar transaction sometimes they are fine and you know happy to pay 10 million 20 million dollars as premium in order to get that peace of mind that if tomorrow something comes up they don't have to pay from their pocket the insurance company will pay for it so they are willing to pay so it's obviously see these are contingent liabilities they may or they may not have to pay right so it's possible that nothing happens and they're still paying a premium but it's possible that something does happen in which case they have an insurance policy in place and that policy can pay off for them company stands behind the warranties in a minority deal now obviously if say you are buying a company and i'm not completely buying the company even if i'm buying 51% of the company or 55% of the company in a majority deal i would never want the company to stand behind the warranties and i would want the sellers to stand behind the warranties the reason being is that imagine that if today the company stands behind the warranties and the company is making you a representation that you know everything is good in the company and there is nothing wrong in the company etc etc if tomorrow you want to sue the company and you go after the company then the company will pay the money from its own accounts you are a shareholder of the company so for every 100 rupees that you get if you have 55% shares 55 rupees are your own money so you will be paying yourself from your own pocket so you would never should you avoid the company backing these warranties and you always say that it should come from the promoters or the sellers of the company warranties from top core entity of substance this entity of substance is what we discussed that you want that the money should come from an entity of substance some entity which has everything in place right you not from a seller or individual seller or somebody or a shell company so you would not want that you know the warranties are coming from a shell company which does no business so tomorrow even if you're suing that company that company will be bankrupt because it doesn't have any money you would want that if it's owned by a company of substance then that company of substance should be giving you the warranty so that if tomorrow you have to sue that company at least you know that it has enough money to pay off your debts warranties and then so part of the warrantors thing is that what is the liability how are liable if there are two or more sellers do they have joint liability that means joint liability means that people have equal liability for any claim so all parties involved share an equal risk in terms of their responsibility in case of a lawsuit right so if there is joint responsibility between two sellers if there is any problem i can uh, i will sue any of the sellers and both of them are equally responsible for it so it's not like you know i am uh, some one uh, one seller can tell me that oh it's not my problem this part of the business was being looked after by the other person so you please deal with that other person you don't want that you want them to have a joint liability 
Then then another concept is a several liability. Several liability is proportionate liability. So in which one seller will say that okay, I was only paid fifty percent of the money, so I am only concerned with fifty percent of the losses. The remaining fifty percent of the losses, you please go against the other seller. I am not paying for it. So there is a joint and several liability concept, which is again a negotiated concept. The other thing is warranties as on which date. Now these representations and warranties that I am giving you. are they as of the execution date or as of, are they as of the completion date or are they on both dates what we generally push if we are from the buyer side is that the warranties have to be repeated on the execution and the closing date now what does that mean warranty as a concept will mean a statement or a fact as of a particular date so if you are saying that as on the execution date the company does not have any loan i want you to repeat that warranty on the closing date also to say that as of the closing date the company does not have any loan right so that i know the condition of the company as of closing as well because there was a gap between signing and closing that is why it is important that the warranties get repeated if the warranties are not repeated then the buyer may wish the seller to warrant that it will not take or permit any action between exchange and completion which may cause a breach of the warranties again but you would want that you know because then it becomes the same thing i'll add interoperative covenants i'll try i'll have to keep a control and check on them and what if they don't inform me that there's been a breach of warranties then who will i go after so it's best to ensure that the warranties and reps and warranties are repeated on buying on the execution date and the closing date because those are, st- are statements which are true as of a particular date so because i will i am saying that as of 1st october there is no loan but if the closing of the transaction is happening on 1st november if there is a loan you can't come to me because i'll say you know as of 1st october there was no loan and i am correct a 1st november here so it's not my problem that's not how it will work so you will have to get those repeated as of buying and the execution date and the closing date right qualifications now how do you qualify these warranties the seller will want that you know these warranties should be qualified because i will say that listen i can tell you that there is no threatened litigation to my knowledge correct imagine if somebody is sitting in their house and they're writing a letter that you know that i am sending this letter to siddharth because i'm suing him for 100 rupees or 1000 rupees i can't imagine it i only know things which are to my knowledge so i would like to qualify these warranties with my awareness so, you know so i would like to so that's also a negotiated point in which sellers say that to my knowledge there is no case against the company because it's possible i have such a huge company it's such a huge company maybe it's a multinational company and i have offices in different countries in different states and different small small localities if a small suit has been filed in some small uh, you know uh, office of my company and maybe it's not reached to me till now you know because there is a lot of bureaucracy within my company as well for all these things it's not like a small you know pn can straight away write an email to the ceo saying they will escalate it to their superiors who will escalate to their superiors and for it to come to me take some time so i can tell you that to my knowledge till now nothing has been escalated to me but yeah that's to my knowledge and that's on my awareness so that's what a seller would want obviously a buyer will push back on this because then you know tomorrow you can claim for anything that you were not aware of it so it puts me in a sticky position so this is also a negotiated things on what can be qualified by awareness and what cannot be qualified by awareness some things are we are, are very sacrosanct things like you are the owner of all the shares that you own the shares and you've not uh, you know encumbered any of the shares or taken any loan against the shares now this is something very sacrosanct for me because i'm buying the shares from you so you can't tell me that to my knowledge i am the owner of all the shares that's not how it works those things have to be absolute statements but yes there are certain things where there can be a chance that you're not aware of something in which case we can discuss the awareness clause or the uh, materiality conflict a disclosure schedule we've already discussed whatever these reps and warranties that we are making uh you know you have a right to disclose against them basically if the dis- warranty says that other than as set out in the uh, disclosure letter the company has no uh debts or other than as set out in the disclosure letter the company has no uh, litigations ongoing or even if the it doesn't say that and it just says that the company has no litigations in place or if the company has no debt in place but there is something uh, you know to the contrary 
you have a right to disclose it in the disclosure letter you so you send me a disclosure letter and you say that okay that other than uh, these five things i have no other debt or other than these six things there is no other litigation so that it helps me also to know that if something a seventh thing comes up tomorrow which was not disclosed then i can sue you for it because it's a fraud or a breach of the warranty which is there materiality qualifiers now you know for a lot of things what i will say is that what is always a pushback a buyer will put a representation or a warranty saying that the company is in compliance with all laws right and the seller will always push back on this and say that i can only give a written warranty saying that the company is in material compliance with all applicable laws the difference between these two is that india has thousands of laws there are state specific laws there are district specific laws and you know people come up with a lot of things it is sometimes possible that there may have been a small letter which i have not done there may be a small filing which i have not done the penalty of which may have been 5 rupees 10 rupees or something very small but technically if i write that i am in compliance with all laws it may be a false statement to give because it's not possible for me to know what all laws that you know everything i for me to say but i can tell you that i am in material compliance with all laws that means that nothing is there which can actually affect the company so it is not that you know i have done a huge blunder or a huge mistake at max what is there is that it may be possible that a, some small thing may be there which has no consequence to the business so i would like to put a materiality qualifier again why are we doing all of this it is risk allocation we want to reduce our risk we want to reduce our exposure so it's all risk allocation which is there right <clears throat> then time limits on warranty claims like i said you would not want that the swat keeps hanging on your head as a seller that any day you know any time even after 10 years or 20 years the buyer can come after you and say that no you remember 20 years ago you had told me that this is not the case but i just figured out that no no you had uh, told the wrong made a misstatement and there was a case against you or there was a loan which you had taken so i want that all my liabilities should be limited to a time period so they should be limited to Five years or six years or three years, whatever we decide commercially, beyond which, if any statement is found to be untrue or misleading, it's not my fault. Obviously, like I said, the exemption which you exception which you always make is that of fraud. If you had done a fraud and if you if you you know if you knew something and you had deliberately hid it from me, then it's a separate ball game. Then obviously there is no time limit on that. Financial limits on warranty claims again. the seller would want that you are warranty your indemnity claim for a breach of warranty should not be more than the money that i have paid right so if you've paid me 100 crores then it has to be limited to 100 crores you can't take more than you've given to me because you know you can't lose more than you paid to me so and even i will not go out of pocket so i would want my liability to be limited on financial terms other limitations which are there in relation to reps and warranties are disregard for change in legislation because obviously that i would say that what i am giving these uh, representations to you today is that i am in compliance with all applicable or material compliance with all applicable laws based on the law of today if tomorrow a new legislation comes and there is a retrospective change so if that legislation says that no everything so this is will be active from 1st of april i could have not foreseen it so i cannot be held accountable for any retrospective changes in law disregard for post completion acts now what has happened is that there was no uh, case against the company for a previous act also but you have bought the company and basis your act in the company you had a fight with uh, say what you produced a batch of products which was faulty and because of that now what the seller is uh, the customer is doing is that it has withheld uh, payments even for the previous batch of products which i had sold and is saying that even those were faulty so if something comes up because of your fault or something which you have done post closing i again cannot be held accountable for it so this is also something which i would want excluded from the liabilities discard of post closing actions which you take uh, or on which i have no control and prevention of double recovery the idea obviously is that you should not be double dipping you should not come after me for the same claim twice so it should not be see i can give you two warranties i can give you a warranty that there is no clear, say um 
that all my licenses are in place a and b the warranty is that all uh, there are no uh, litigation or no governmental claims against me right now because you figure out that this one license which i did not have and because of that now the government agency is coming after you as a notice you can only so claim that notice under one of the warranties from me and obviously i'll pay you for the entire loss but you can't come to me under the separate warranties and claim the money twice saying that okay you know you bro uh, there was a breach of this uh, one license uh, one warranty where you said you did not have a license i had to pay a, a penalty of 10 crores for that so pay me for that and for the other one you come to me and say that you had told me that there is no government investigation but no because you did not have a license there was a government investigation because of which i had to pay 10 crores to so pay it to me again so there's no double recovery which can happen for any set of circumstances and any claim i can only pay you once so these are the limitations which we put what are the common areas of warranty protection now there are things called fundamental warranties there are things called business warranties and there are things called tax warranties fundamental warranties are the warranties on which we do not accept any limitation on liability we there is a strong pushback from the buyer saying that these are things which are fundamental to me buying the company things like authority capacity you are telling me you have the authority to sell the shares you have complete ownership of the shares you have complete title to the shares and you're selling it to me so you know these are things if tomorrow you don't have the title to sell the shares to me you did not have ownership of the shares and you know you were just passing it along to me then there is no liability on the amount and i should have a full right to come after you even if after 10 years i come to know that this uh, you did not own the shares and the new owner comes after me i should have the right to come after you shareholding pattern if you are telling me that the company only has four shareholders and we have only issued equity shares to four shareholders then that is a sacrosanct thing tomorrow once i bought the company there could not be a fifth person who comes and says that okay i did not have shares but i had these written convertible notes that you had issued to me which i now want to convert into equity so that cannot be the case you have to tell me what all is there in the company the solvency if you are not solvent of the companies in uh, about to be insolvent or you as a seller are about to become insolvent that so then i should be made aware of it and you should give me a proper representation and warranty on what is your solvency status it is not something it's a fundamental warranty for me the basis on which i'm doing a transaction with you right then because what happens is that tomorrow you go to bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings happen they will look into your previous transactions which you've undertaken in the past 6 7 months and then if they see any transaction where you've undervalued a transaction or sold something cheaply they can come back against those transactions then they can unwind those transactions saying that okay you know you were going bankrupt as a company but you sold your shares for 100 rupees instead of 150 rupees which was the market value so now let's unwind that transaction so i don't want to get into the middle of all that so i want a proper solvency status from you title and all these are called fundamental warranties things which are fundamental and of great importance for me to buy the company then we have business warranties business warranties are in relation to the targets business and the deal mechanism so obviously fund business warranties are like account warranties which you give contracts which you give and the laws which are there so accounts warranty saying that all my financial accounts have been maintained properly events which are taken place post closing that so between signing and closing i have not done anything in you know which will harm the company i have not taken any loans i have not that anb between signing and closing those ones all my contracts i say my all my contracts are at arms length basis i have not done undue favor to anybody all the contracts that i have shown you are valid and subsisting you know all, all everything has been properly stamped there are no cases against me none of the contracts have been terminated etc etc then the laws the laws you would say that you know business related laws that the company is in material compliance with all the applicable laws the company has all the licenses and permits in place in order to carry on the business or you know the company has complied with all the applicable labor laws we have made all the uh, gratuity payments on time we've made all the epf contributions on time the company has made all the esi contributions on time you say that you know ip laws that you've been uh, fall adhering to the data protection laws that are there you've been uh, adhering to all the other laws which are there absence of litigation you give them a statement saying that you know there are no cases against the company there is no litigation against the company 
and the like. So these are business warranties. Last are tax warranties. You obviously say that you know the company and the sellers have paid their taxes on time. There are no tax proceedings against the company because Section two eighty one. What does the Section two eighty one say? That if you have pending tax proceedings against the company and the income tax department is not able to uh, get that money from you, that tax money from you, they can attach your assets, and your assets also include your shares. So if you have sold your shares to me. and tomorrow the income tax department comes after you saying that you've not paid your taxes and now we are going to uh, take your shares which you show, sold to somebody they should not come after my shares it's a problem to my title to the shares so that is why you take a tax warranties as well some more examples of warranties from the next page some you know common areas of warranty protection accounts warranty i have told you that uh, audited accounts and management accounts give a true and fair view and comply with applicable law and accounting principles the auditors owe their duties to the company or the business and not normally to the prospective buyers post balance sheet events like we discussed the interim period um, whatever the company is doing or if you have log box accounts up to a particular date you would say that you know after 31st march 2021 the company has not undertaken activities which are outside the ordinary course of business etc uh, etc et there are extensive warranties you have set out saying that you know all these actions have not been taken by the company related party transactions why i would want to know that everything that you undertaken with your related parties that should be at arms length there should not be any you know uh, undue transactions that you are undertaking with your relatives or your employees or you know uh, some of their sh- uh, shareholders so all of your related parties your transactions should be at arms length and in ordinary course if there are transactions which are not at arms length or at ordinary course you please let me know because like uh, what i'll tell you an example is that a lot of times what happens is uh, companies have intergroup Uh, arrangements so you may be buying a company of one of the group companies which is into manufacturing and there must be another group company within that same group which procures raw materials now that inter group related party agreement they were selling the raw materials very cheaply to them right but after you buy the company they will renegotiate the clauses and then if they want to sell at arms length the prices will increase for the raw materials so you would want to know up front that if all the transactions that you've entered into even with related parties they are at arms length and there is no hidden costs which are there or excessive or lesser costs that you're getting or preferential treatment that you're getting and if it is the case please let me know financing arrangements and though you know the buyer will require appropriate warranties concerning the targets banking facilities security documents bank accounts you know i would want to know that the company only has these four bank accounts i would want to know that the company you know is in compliance with all its uh, loan facilities i would want to know that other than these five loans which are there there is no sixth loan which the company has taken i would want to know that other than the fact that you've disclosed to me that you've secured four assets of the company there is no additional asset that you actually ta- uh, you know taken a, a mortgage against for the company and you will buy or acquire the company debt free the uh, agreed purchase price may be applied in part for procuring repayment of the target of the existing banking borrowing so you would want to know that you know what part of that money that you knowing giving is should be used to pay back the loans then in the real estate sector if you go to the next slide real estate the warranties are made on a good and marketable title to the property because if you actually buying a land or you have immovable property ownership of immovable property you should be sure that you know people have good and marketable title to that property that's a warranty that you'll take so that tomorrow if they don't have proper title to the warranty you can go for breach of warranty compliance with these old obligations repair of and condition of properties any residual liabilities for leases that are there in commercial contracts you want to know that all the contracts are in full force and effect there is an absence of any breach of the contracts or any material obligations are outstanding under such contracts you would want to know that no termination notices have been received under those contracts as part of the warranties and no material contract would terminate as a result of the transaction when it comes to employees you would want to know that the company is in compliance with all the uh, uh, employment legislations the validity of the employment contracts whether or not the contracts are properly valid and subsisting the company is in compliance with all the employment labor legislations you would want to know that the company is not entered into separate trade union agreements or a collaborative bargaining agreement with its employees you know tomorrow it should not be the case that there is some agreement that you separately entered into with the uh, trade union of the company and then the company has to adhere to those contracts you would want to know that there is no change in terms of employment since the specified date of the employees 
and the other warranties which are generally there are your no litigation ip compliance with law and tax which we've discussed already then where what is happens with the indemnity regime now the indemnity we've taken us these laundry list of warranties and everything which is there but how does that play with the indemnity now indemnity is basically given for a breach of the warranty and for the specific indemnity items that i'll set out basis my diligence it is risk allocation versus due diligence like we previously discussed that the idea behind the indemnity regime is to say that you are responsible for everything that has happened in the company prior to the closing date and basis the comp what is do and the picture that you've shown me that this is the position of the company as in closing date is based on the warranty schedule that i have now if there is any deviation from that or is there any breach of that you should indemnify me for it so there is a whole push back on the risk allocation between the buyer and the seller and obviously based on the due diligence we come to know what exactly is that risk which we help mitigate what is the difference between warranties and indemnities warranties are obviously warranty is a statement uh, of a fact the breach of which will uh, give you a right to claim an indemnity an indemnity is just the payment that you make for a breach of any warranty that you have or for a specific indemnity item point to note who is liable so like we said who is liable is who's the warrantor so if the warranties are being given by the promoters or the warranties are given by the companies you would want them to pay up for any breach of it you would want that it is, it is an entity of substance which is actually paying the money ultimately and it's not a shell company or someone else against whom even if you go and you know make a claim for indemnity they won't have money to pay to you repetition as a sell from a seller side you should make sure that there is no repetition in the warranties that are being given and you would you should try to you know like i said there should be no double dipping you should not claim for the same uh, loss twice make sure that language is there caps on liability like we discussed that you know all these liability has to be capped at something you you know that you can't just randomly come after me for any amount you want everything my liability should be capped to a particular amount saying that my liability cannot be more than the amount you've paid me or it should not be more than 80% of the amount that you've paid me so it should be properly capped de minimis de minimis as a concept is that obviously when you're buying a company of a huge magnitude you should have some risk as uh, some business risk is what you should take so you i will tell you that if say you are paying 1000 crores for this company so if there is a claim you have against me indemnity claim which is below an amount of 50 lakhs you take it as a business risk it is only if the cumulative uh, things uh, if a particular individual thing is more than 50 lakhs it is then that you can actually use it as an indemnifiable claim against me you can come after me for it but if it's below that amount it's your problem it's past part of your business risk it's such a huge business that you're running obviously there will be some amount of risk which is involved in it so you can't come to me for every 10 rupee loss that you have so there is a de minimis to it then a threshold or basket is that even if it's a 50 lakh claim but you can't just come after me if it's just a 50 lakh claim if a cumulative uh, claim a basket of claims of more than 5 crores is there then you come after me and then i will pay you the entire 5 crores but if it is less than that so firstly every claim will have to be more than 50 lakhs each and when those claims which are more than 50 lakhs each are cumulatively more than 5 crores in aggregate then you come to me for an indemnity claim and then i'll pay it to you below that it is your problem it's a business risk you running a 1000 crore company 4-5 crore loss. If even if you have, it's part of normal business. So if only if it's something in excess of that, you come after me. Time limits, like we discussed, everything has to be time bound. It has to be that all my liability in relation to fundamental warranties or business warranties and everything should be till a particular amount of time, and it should not be indefinite. So that is something from a risk allocation purpose that I will try to push for as a seller, and the buyer will want as much as possible. escrow we've already discussed how it works in an indemnity scenario that as a safety net i would want there to be an escrow account and i would want certain money to be held back for a period of time so that if any loss arises or if i come to know of anything that there was a breach of warranty i can easily extract the money from the escrow amount rather than going to you and taking the money from you in this the only thing you need to make sure is that if there is a foreign buyer the government like i said wants you to pay a minimum of fair market value so even after the indemnity amount is extracted the final money which is given by the foreigner 
to the Indian resident should be more than the fair market value. So that is something which needs to be done. Enforcement risk, obviously, uh, what is there is like we were discussing that if that company is not a proper, it's a, a company of substance, it's a shell company. How would you do it? Who will you go after? Right. So you need to see that you can properly enforce what you have also. And it's not just something which looks good on paper. Practically, also, it should be something that you can enforce. Knowledge of the sellers, which we've already discussed, that is how you, uh, you know, uh, qu uh, qualify your warranty saying that these are things which are to the knowledge of the sellers. Something which is not to my knowledge is not what I can comment on. So you have to qualify your warranties with knowledge. So that's from a seller side. You need to make sure that your warranties are qualified to the extent you want to. From knowledge because it's possible that you know i i would say that i have not received a notice from any government authority in the past three years but i will qualify it saying to my knowledge again if there was some small government notice which came and you know which was given to the guard of my company and it never reached me only i'm not aware of it so if it's there tomorrow i cannot comment on it you can't sue me for fraud uh so you know so in from that perspective knowledge becomes very important Indemnity for breach versus contractual damages. Indemnity, like I said, is, is uh, what you have agreed under the contract. It is governed by what you have in the contract agreed that this is the amount of indemnity you are required to be paid if this is the breach which happens or this is the loss you occur because of breach of warranty or a misrepresentation. Contractual damages is when you have to go, then you, when you go to court, you sue them for damages and then in the court you uh, try to prove whether or not it was a loss in accordance with the Contract Act, Indian Contract Act. Over there then you have to prove that it's a direct loss, it's not a consequential loss and it's a much greater process. So you always want there to be a properly contractually agreed indemnity regime in your documents. Conduct of claims, like I was telling you previously, what conduct of claims would mean is that uh, you want when you're buying a company, <coughs> right? So, and you have these litigations which are running or any claim which comes, you want the right to run those claims because ultimately you are liable to pay that money. So I don't trust you that, you know, which lawyer you are taking or, you know, how will you prepare your defense? I want to run the entire process because I am liable to pay as a seller. So I tell you that, okay, fine. If tomorrow anybody sues you for something and you think that it is, uh, you know, a breach of warranty and I owe you that money, that is fine. Let me run the case. Let me choose the lawyers. Let me do everything. And if, you know, and as and when, then what is the final amount which is required to be paid, then I will pay it. But I want to make sure that we are putting forward the best defense. So let me do the conduct of claims. You don't do anything. Right. Because I don't want that if you are running the case tomorrow, you will go and settle for, you know, you won't fight the case only if somebody sends you a notice for 100 crores, you will know that Achha, I have an indemnity of 100 crores from the seller. Let me just pay it off and take it from the seller. So this is not how it will work. I know for a fact that this claim, if I contest it, if I go to court, I can settle this for around 5, 10 crores. So let me do the conduct of claims. Let me go to court and then whatever is the settlement amount, I'll pay that. So, you know, I would want to have the conduct of claims in that respect. Then the next thing, post-completion undertakings. Now, everything has happened. Post-completion restrictive covenants. What are they? Uh, what do they cover? Sometimes we have non-compete, non, uh, you know, non-solicit provisions on the seller. Because today I have bought this huge company from you. I have bought this huge, you know, software from you that you're selling to me. I do not want that tomorrow, as soon as you've sold this company to me, you start a new company and remake the similar kind of a software for yourself because you have the know-how, you know the people in the industry, you know, you know the suppliers, you know everybody, you know the customers, you know the clients. So I don't want you to start competing with me tomorrow as soon as I buy this company from you. So I will put a non-compete restriction on you saying that for the next three years, you can't enter into a competing business than what I'm doing. And this money that I've paid you for the company, that includes a non-compete fee as well. Non-compete, you know, sometimes till a certain extent, if you've linked it to the money in the SPA, it is enforceable. But if you put it as part of the employment agreement, then post-termination non-competes are considered a restraint to trade. So it's a gray area that, you know, they're not uh, mostly the courts do not uh, approve it. So you have to make sure that it's linked to the price that you're paying to the sellers under the SPA for it to be enforceable as a non-compete provision. Use of name and other IP rights. Like I said, you've sold a company to me and it was this huge Haldiram brand. You can't tomorrow start using a similar name 
and uh, start your own company on similar lines everything has been owned by me you have to put restrictions on you confidential information you have a know how in relation to the company you've been running the company for the past 10 years before i bought it from you so you know everything about it you can't go about divulging that confidential information to other people now that i bought this company from you you can't go to my competitors and tell them everything that you know about the company so all of these things you can't do so i put this confidentiality uh, restrictions on you and information access you would want them to inform you of anything that comes to their knowledge within a period of time which they think might be a breach of the warranty or if it is something that you know some contractors are, or some customers are still reaching out to you and placing orders i would want you to come to me and you know give me all that information or redirect them to me so these are some post completion undertakings which we put in the document so that's the spa and quickly now i will uh, wrap the sha up in the next 5 to 10 minutes and then we'll open the floor for questions sha again you know mostly it happens it will happen only in the case where you have few shareholders which are left in the company and you want to see how the company is being run and you want to set out the governance of the company so for the sha what you'll have as a broad skeleton is the board of directors who will who has the right to appoint the board of directors the company has five shareholders does everybody have a right to appoint one director or is it that a uh, two shareholders are the major shareholders they should get a right to appoint two shareholders each and everybody else gets only one shareholder so what is the composition of the board who can remove the shareholders and who can appoint new shareholders quorum requirements mean that if today i am having a board meeting does that mean that i can uh, invite everybody is required to have because the law says the companies act says that for any valid board meeting you only need two uh, two directors to be present for the company to have a valid board meeting but it's possible that there are five shareholders and five shareholders everybody has a right to nominate one shareholder so all those other three shareholders will also want that one of their representative should always be there in every board meeting of the company so you will contractually agree to a quorum requirement saying that the company should have a minimum of five uh, directors for any valid board meeting to take place so that's a quorum requirement alternate directors means that in case any director is not being able to attend a meeting you should have a right to call an alternate director because say if i am not physically present then i should have a right to nominate someone else to attend the meeting on my behalf as an alternate director the sha will have your preemption rights saying that obviously tomorrow if the company is issuing new shares or securities to anybody i should get a you know we should get a right to uh, the first right to buy those securities and if we are not uh, willing to buy it as a preemption right then the company can issue shares to someone else exit rights like we've discussed the ipo a lot of companies what they have an exit right because you're financial investors mostly the investors who are there are financial investors who are investing in the company and they want to leave the company in the next 5 years after making a profit so they set out these different exit rights through which they can exit the company one of the exit rights is an ipo an ipo says that with uh, i'm putting money in the company the promoters of the company will try and make an ipo in the next 5 years and if you hold an ipo in the next 5 years i will get an exit because i'll sell my shares to the public at that time tag along rights we discussed yesterday that if somebody is selling the shares i have a right to tag along with them and sell my shares along with them this is generally a minority protection right giving me a right to exit because the promoters or the larger shareholders have a better chance of finding a good buy, uh, buyer as compared to the sell, uh, small shareholders drag along rights also we discussed yesterday which is basically that any one shareholder says that okay it's been 5 years since i put in money in the company you've not been able to get me a good exit you've not been able to provide me a better return you are not the company is not going anywhere i have found a very good buyer who's willing to pay say uh, you know a very nice amount for the company so you have to, i can drag all the other shareholders along with me and force them to sell their shares to that person at the agreed price drag along now put option call option is that uh, you have an put option is when you put out your shares and uh, ask the other person the promoters or the sh other shareholders of the company to compulsorily buy your shares out call option is when you can ask uh, uh, call on them to buy their shares from them so the idea about this is that obviously as an exit i have not gotten an exit in 5 years i can use it and i can say that okay because you've not been you know given me an exit through a third party you have to buy out my shares so you give a notice to the other shareholders to compulsorily buy your shares 
and the call option is that if you're thinking that you know the person has done a default or something wrong is happening in the company and you think that it's best that you take over the company and you've negotiated a call right for yourself you call on the shares from that other shareholders to buy them out and uh, then you can take control of the company write a first offer and write a first refusal i think we discussed at length yesterday so that is remain the same term and termination of an sha will set out that the sha is valid uh, until all this you remain a shareholder in the company the moment you don't remain a shareholder in the company obviously you don't have any shareholding rights also termination from the perspective that if there is an event of default which happens on part of one of the shareholders or you know they are in breach of their obligation under the agreement we can terminate the shareholder agreement until their extent and take away all their rights in the company so you put in all these clauses miscellaneous clauses again governing law dispute resolution we've discussed what those clauses are an assignment clause basically says in a shareholders agreement that you, no shareholder can assign his or her rights in the company without the prior consent of the other shareholders and the only time maybe you can assign your rights is when you're selling your shares to another party but that person to whom you're selling the shares also has to sign a deed of adherence saying that they will abide by all the clauses which we have agreed to in the shareholder agreement so that is it when it comes to the sha and yeah so under drafting the spa what we've discussed is very similar to when you're doing an asset purchase or a bta the concepts remain the same the conditions precedent uh, the you know condition precedent the reps and warranties the indemnities everything remains the same the only thing which will change in case of an asset purchase or a bta is that instead of the shares you'll be buying the assets of the company so that's the only uh, you know limited part where the drafting changes but the major concepts remain the same over there as well so yes thank you so much with this we come to an end of the series and uh, now the floor is open for any questions that people may have so mohit i think mohit has raised his hand uh, yeah good afternoon sir uh, so in the previous session uh, you raised one point that uh, Uh, if it's let's say that that was the bankruptcy uh, court thing that the company went for bankruptcy, but instead of bankruptcy, they uh, negotiated with creditors and uh, came out of uh, bankruptcy uh, without declaring. No, 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 they did not come out of bankruptcy. They did not negotiate yes. with creditors. The promoters ended up buying uh, the company as part of the insolvency process. Right. Mm -hmm. So you suggested that in that case, the company can be restructured. and all the assets can be transferred to a new company and then uh, it can be purchased so in that case uh, will not that create any regulatory issues because later on uh, it's up the to them they might say that it is uh, specially for this purchase and creditors has been put to disadvantage no, so no, if, it's so, up to them what we do in that case is that it's up to them to create a new company Mm -hmm. get all the approvals that they need to we will obviously do our due diligence and then again once they create the new company and if the same issues remain that the creditors are unhappy and they've not taken prior approvals before doing it so obviously then it's up to their headache we walked away from the deal we walked away from that deal and okay. we told them that the only time we can do it is if you can create a clean structure for us so we at that time put the entire onus on them because obviously you know if you have claims people have claims against you you have, you owe money to people so it's not like you can just clear out all the assets of your company and put it in a new company right. so that will put them to a disadvantage like you correctly said but what we did is we put the onus on them we said you get all the approvals you clear out all the money you do everything give us a clean and uh, company and it is only then that we will consider this deal otherwise we walked away okay so basically like so if it's without creditors approval that may be a future liability obviously th because then it's, then it's the same thing now it's the same thing which we are avoiding in the first place then again you will have those liabilities on us okay thank you sir thank you i think people have put something in the chat box as well yeah ajit has that why would the party conduct a dd despite the warrantors providing reps and warranties what are the limitations of dd kindly explain the sandbagging and anti sandbagging provisions how ebitda is calculated its perspective concerns for both sides buyer side and seller side in calculation earn outs how can risk of losing oh these are one hour long uh, discussions now how can risk of losing customers and other orders competitors during integration be controlled okay i'll try and be brief about each and everything 
Now, why would a buyer want party want to conduct a DD despite the government is providing reps and warranties? Now, see, the idea is that it's your risk capital right now. So if I am just relying on the person providing reps and warranties, then tomorrow, if there is a breach of those reps and warranties, I will have to then I go through a proper indemnity process. You may dispute that indemnity process or you may claim that you don't have money. And then after that, uh, you know, I will have to sue you in court. It's a huge process which will happen. But if I've done my own diligence, half of these things I know beforehand that these are the problems in the company. I have, would have asked you to rectify a few things in the company or they, I may have found some red flags because of which I don't want to proceed with the deal as well. So, you know, if I don't do a DD and I'm just relying on what you're telling me and while it is fine that tomorrow I can come and sue you and I can ask you for indemnity, but there may have been certain things which would have, if I would have found out as part of my diligence, I would have not gone ahead with the transaction only. So why to deprive myself of that opportunity? The reps and warranties is a good to have because so that it's a backup to me that if I missed something as part of my diligence, I can still sue you as part of reps and warranties. But a diligence is still something which I would want to do because otherwise I'm going into the company blind without knowing what I'm buying. And all I'm taking is your word on it. Correct. What are the limitations of a due diligence? Uh, limitations of a due diligence, I think uh, what you're asking, like I told you previously also, is I till a certain amount of time, uh, you know, for a certain amount of things, what I can verify publicly through publicly available information is fine. But what I can't verify through publicly information, things like if you've received a notice from somebody who's threatening to sue you, if you've uh, you know received any notice from any government authority, if you're having any communication with any government authority, which you've not disclosed to me, and it's not possible for me to publicly go and find about that, then I'm dependent to you on you about it. Even when I'm doing a litigation search, uh, while you know most of the records of the high courts and supreme courts and some district courts are digitalized, that's not the case for every court in India. So it is. Uh, so I can't sitting over here in my office in Delhi figure out that if in some small village, you know, somewhere in some small district uh, court, a case has been filed against you. You know, it's not something which we, I can find out on their website. It's not digitized. So if you're not disclosing it to me, I will never come to know about it. So obviously the limitation is that for some things, we are dependent on the information that is provided to us. I will not know what you don't tell me to things to the extent I can publicly verify well and good. But for the other things, there is a limitation. I am dependent on what you're telling me. Kindly explain sandbagging and anti-sandbagging. So sandbagging uh, provisions, which I generally put is that my knowledge of a particular event uh, will not impede my uh, idea. See, I am conducting a diligence on you. Now I am conducting a diligence on you, but even despite the fact that my knowledge of a particular event will not stop my ability to or inhibit my ability uh, to uh, sue you for any uh, law, uh, indemnity loss. So, you know, we put this anti-bank banking language is saying that the company is buyer is not aware of anything, uh, uh, you know, which is prejudicial to the company. And that, you know, in case something happens for which the buyer already had knowledge, you will not have a right to uh, sue the sellers for that or get indemnity for that. As compared to what we push back on is that, listen, we are doing our diligence for our own sake, but you are giving us reps and warranties despite that. So if there is a breach in those reps and warranties, it is on you. You cannot tell me that, you know, you it's not a breach or it's not fraud because you were aware of it because you had given me a data dump of thousand documents and I was supposed to go through each and every word of it. So we have these sandbagging and anti-sandbagging provisions in that regard, which are there. EBITDA is again, you see, we don't calculate it. It's EBITDA is calculated uh, by your professionals. So you will have your investment bankers and you will have... Uh, uh, you know, your uh, CAs and everybody who will calculate the bitta. So it's done by the business people. We as m and lawyers do not get into what is, you know, how are they calculating the bitta. What we do put is that we ask the financial teams to give us a definition of what is a bitta. And then we try and uh, put it in the calculations. Buyer side and seller side in calculating earnouts. See, I'll tell you. So, uh, uh, Bitta from a perspective where it can become important is from an earnout perspective is that I have milestones attached to you getting certain earnouts. So, I have told you that you are staying back in the company and you are staying back in the company for the next five years. If the company is able to achieve a certain Bitta margin in the first year, you will get 10 crores. 
if the other milestone for the second year is this amount if you're able to do it within the next uh, one year if you're able to reach that milestone again you get an uh, additional earn out amount so we structure the earn outs basis the milestones you achieved on ebitda it's not necessary or not important that all earn outs are linked only to the ebitda that is come out you can structure it any way you want the milestone can be anything the milestone can be the company getting 1000 customers new customers in the next one year the milestone can be the company you know achieving uh, uh launching a new product successfully in the next one year it can be any milestone which you can link the earn out to but yes ebitda is also one of those milestones to which earn outs are linked to how can the risk yeah, uh, well, man. Uh, actually sir in the we have we know that the buyers had always intended towards the ebitda calculation but the seller is not very much willing towards the ebitda it's very a com- cumbersome calculation for the financial yeah but it's a financial uh, calculation uh, generally they don't come to lawyers for m and lawyers for it they will not ask you to calculate it they will have their investment bankers they'll have their cas to do that calculation for you yes, so you yes, won't sir. need to uh, bother with the calculation as a lawyer at least yes sir, um, definitely thank you how can the risk of losing customers and or orders to competitors during integration be controlled it's an implementation perspective na so risk of losing customers and orders to competitors during integration from a merger this is something you have to do you have to have a proper implementation strategy in place so these things are not which are done overnight right so everything what we as a legal team will be doing but the business team simultaneously will be working on its own so the business team will be reaching out to the customers the business team would have previously spoken with all the clients and you know you would know the business mostly the person who's buying your company will already be in the same field uh, as you are so they would know what all are the challenges which are there so they would want they would have actually done all of that in the background so and they have an implementation plan or they have this you know consolidation plans in place so these are things which the business teams of the company have in place uh, beforehand uh, in place you from my perspective what i can do in my legal documentation is that i can put clauses in which i will tell you that okay you cannot compete against me you cannot uh, go and uh, tell my com- company secrets to somebody as a seller the seller cannot help my competitors in actually getting all of this done right and plus i as part of my diligence have already taken these reps and warranties from you that you have good long standing relationships with your customers none of the contracts with those customers can get terminated on account of this transaction and i've seen as part of my diligence have done all of these things we've spoken to the clients all the customers through which we had to take the consents we've already taken their consents from them so all of that you can do from a transaction documentation or risk minimization perspective you can put restrictions on the seller that the seller will not do anything which will cause harm to the business the seller will not go to the competitor and tell them that listen these are the five big customers that they have and i know them personally you can come and take those customers away so those are not things you can do and so you can put the restrictions on the seller from doing that but obviously under no way can i as a lawyer or you as a lawyer you can put any restriction on any third party to go to the customers and tell them that okay you know because those two companies are merging i can give you a better rate come to me then it's obviously up to that customer if their contract allows them to terminate the contract and go to someone else they can very well do it it's a free trade it's a free society that's not an issue but what you can do is that you can prevent the seller from doing anything which can cause harm to you is that fine ajit yes sir yes sir well <laughs> explained sir thank you so much sir giving thank such you, sir. a amount of time to me no no thank you so much uh, is there any other question sir one last question i have in my mind is that uh, i just want to know in during the due diligence process so uh, how can we minimize the issues or related to the esop is uh, as we know uh, yesterday uh, sebi has issue a notice amendment uh, amended the esop is of the uh, 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 sebi uh, amendment and sweat equity regulation 2021 they are telling that this this will um, improve the governance issues but in the d- uh, dd process uh, how can we just minimize the issues related to them to the esops which are there yes sir yes sir see esops are what so esops are your employee your employee stock option plans 
Now, why do I give you an ESOP? ESOPs are given to incentivize the employees. Now, you are an employee of the company. You are working towards increasing the brand value of the company. You are working day and night for the company. I give you an ESOP. I say that your ESOP exercise price is very small. The exercise price of your ESOP is ten rupees. But tomorrow, you know, you can use that buy the share of the company for ten rupees, even if the value of that share at that time is hundred rupees. We have that exercise price. The idea is to incentivize you as an employee. to give you uh, so that you feel that you're part of the company you have some skin in the game when it comes to the company and if the shared value of the company grows or if the company grows your money that you're getting from that esop that value will also increase so it's there given generally you know as a sense of giving a sense of ownership to the employees and obviously rewarding them for their hard work esops are you know also given as part of your compensation package in in addition to the salary you're given certain esops of the company which have certain value of the company as a lawyer when you're doing a dd you need to make sure that you know all the esop grant letters are in place what are the vesting periods that who all is eligible to exercise the esop plan is it that because of the company that the esop plan says that if you are buying a company and there's a change in control in the company does that mean you know some people have that thing in the esop plan that in case of a change in control of the company there will be something called an accelerated vesting and everybody all the uh, you know uh, employees will have a right to convert their uh, exercise their options and buy the shares of the company or the company will be obligated to buy back the esops from them at a particular price so that you know in case of a change in control all the employees get cashed out and they get their money at that time so you need to look out for these terms which are there in the esop schemes and the esop grant letters from a change of control perspective Um, so you, we have a query in the comment box by Shristi. So if you could address that, I'll just do that. Uh, is the discovery during DD covered by privilege, or can the buyer bring action against seller for the latter's uh, illegality after walking away from the deal, or intimate the appropriate regulatory body about illegal acts at the company, say money laundering scheme? See, then say again there. So if you walked away from the deal, right? So I cannot sue you. See, whatever, even if I was buying the company. i would have been able to uh, claim indemnity only for the loss that i suffered so if i have walked away from a deal i obviously cannot sue you for any loss which i have occurred but like you're saying that if i found out firstly i am bound by confidentiality obligations in a dd you bound by confidentiality obligations irrespective you sign an nda so irrespective of whether i uh, you know walk away from the deal or not i am bound by those confidentiality obligations obviously you can you know be a whistle blower and send it to somebody or if it's something as huge you know which is has a criminal aspect to it then obviously there become exceptions to it but mostly the idea is that even if you walked away from a diligence and uh, that will not uh, affect your confidentiality obligation then your nda will specifically set out that irrespective of whether you go ahead with the deal or not uh, if there is uh, you know whatever information that you get from this you will have to keep it to yourself but an exemption to it or an uh, you know exception to it is obviously that if the regulator or a government authority comes and asks me that okay you know uh, siddharth you did a diligence on this company as a buyer and did you see any irregularity then obviously at that time i'm supposed to tell I mean, that i can't say that no i've signed an nda with them because then obviously it's a criminal act but that's a difference but that is an exceptional case i mean that has to be something of a high magnitude but in general even if you walk away from a diligence your nda will survive that and you are required to adhere to the confidentiality obligations irrespective of whether you buy a company or not uh, so mohit and istars had raised their hand so if mohit could go first with his query yeah uh no i am already Uh, Mohit already asked, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's asked. Okay, sir. So my doubt is regarding uh, not actually the terminologies with due diligence, but uh, it is regarding the opportunity or scope of uh, within the due diligence team of firms. Uh, how about the company secretary as a profession? Because I'm a CS executive student at this moment, and uh, so company secretary is good. So we see. I'll tell you. Uh, being when you do the company secretary course, so you become very familiar with the entire corporate compliance perspective. you know what all corporate compliances are there from a company's perspective you know how the board minutes are required to be made you know what all filings are required to be made by the company you know so you get a very good idea about those things and that is the knowledge which you can apply while you're doing a diligence for the company 
why not so when if you're doing a corporate chapter of the company and you are a cs you'll have a very good idea when you see their board minutes you you know they're not properly maintained you'll see the shareholder minutes you'll see they're not properly maintained as part of the secretarial standards you will have an idea about what all filings the company is required to do uh, with the roc and those filings they've not done so it does help you with that so i think yeah it's a good thing to know so uh, particularly uh, do firms uh, specifically uh, hire css as a professionals into the firms or like uh, only as a lawyer so much of the cases and lawyers and, and uh, shavas this is a safe space so if he's saying something i think let's it remain over here only so Shabazz was saying it in the lighter sense, I think. I know, I know. <laughs> saying it in the lighter sense. The laugh emoticon. So. No, no, I understand that. That's what I was saying. Uh, yeah, sorry, Raj. No, uh, uh, regarding that, uh, that part I already know that we cannot give exam together, so uh, it's up to. Ah, uh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, even I know that I barely say that. <laughs> and also one doubt uh, so if you permit uh, one more uh, doubt i have it is regarding that uh, the current development legal development uh, battle that is being going between z and invesco so yeah. uh, uh, yesterday the uh, z again uh, went to the high court filing a petition against invesco the uh, EGM. EGM. yeah the agm requisition notice hmm. specifically saying that the notice is illegal and uh, yeah. invalid so uh I, my my doubt is regarding why would they re reach out to high court and instead of nclt is there any specific jurisdiction first they went to nclt only but after no. that uh, no so i'll tell you what happened so what is this entire egm notice which is coming is that the investco uh, has sent a notice along with which are one of the other shareholders which is there to say that they want to change the board of the company they want to change the board of the company they want to appoint six new independent directors and they want to change this uh, ceo i think the executive director who's there now z as f u c section 100 of the companies act section 100 of the companies act says that any shareholders holding 10% or more of the shares if the shareholders want one or more shareholders owning 10% or more of the shares of the company they can go and they can actually uh, uh, ask for a <clears throat> uh sorry if they can go and they can ask for an egm to take place right they can convene an egm they can go to the board asking for an egm to be convened now in this case when they've gone ahead and asked for it the z has said that you can't do it a because you are asking us to change the directors of the company which will require uh, approval from the uh what is it which will require approval from the mib because we have a license from the ministry of information and broadcasting which says that if you want to change any key managerial person you require their prior approval so you don't have those prior approvals so that egm cannot take place for you to change the board of the company secondly they are saying that if you undertaking such an important uh, you know uh, decision that you are uh, undertaking so many directors of the company appointing six new directors of the company and changing the main management of the company that may amount to a change in control of the company that you're doing and for such a change in control where you want to appoint six uh, new independent directors and you want to improve the current remove the current management of the company that may be a change in control of the company and under the takeover code we might have to go and you know uh, do an open offer again i'm not commenting on the veracity of these statements i'm just saying that these are the positions that they are taking on uh, you know defending themselves so they are saying that you've not followed due process under the securities act under the companies act and uh, you know taken proper permission and licenses where it was required and accordingly they are saying that your demand for an egm is not correct and uh, in accordance that is why they uh, removed it i think the nclt to which they originally went uh, nclt told them uh, to uh, go over there to reconsider and call the egm which they did not do and now they've gone to the high court uh, yes sir uh, now after the uh, yesterday they went to high court and uh, filed a civil suit in their original jurisdiction saying that this uh, notice has to be declared as invalid and illegal 
because they're saying that illegal you're not following due process they are yeah. questioning their intention behind this one of the other reasons also is that one of the uh, conditions in that sony merger that they have is that this puneet goenka fellow has to continue as a executive director in the company so you know it puts uh, them in a very sticky position if they uh, these investors are asking him to be removed so that there are a lot of commercial considerations over there and i think what z is also doing is that's using its battery of lawyers to fight it off in whichever way possible so you know they are also doing and filing cases and whatever civil cases and ncelts and appellate courts wherever they can file cases they are doing it and they are exploring all the legal opportunities and all the legal possibilities and options that they have whether or not the courts will you know reject it saying that we don't have jurisdiction or we have jurisdiction or let the nclt decide that is uh, something which over the time we'll see but right now z is using all of its might to defend this okay sir thank you Uh, but sir uh, in that case investors directly can call the egm because as per section 100 if board is not calling uh but it's a long process na it's not overnight the board has a particular amount of time till which 21 days they have to 21 days uh, 21 days they have to call and if after 21 days it's not called then they have a right to call so that's a process which is there but what z is saying is that this very ask for an egm is incorrect it's not that we are calling or not calling what they are going to quote is that this very ask for an egm to replace the board of directors is wrong because they've not followed the abcd due process which is required to be followed so okay. that is the entire thing so if you read uh, and i think there is enough material on the net on this also and one of the reasons they're saying is that you don't have prior approvals which are required to change the board maybe changing making such a huge change in the board of directors of the company and changing the management can amount to change in control of the company so you've not followed the takeover code regulations which are there plus they are saying that you know we all the directors that have been appointed by the company they've been properly vetted and after proper deliberations and discussions they've been uh, you know appointed so etc etc there are a lot of these different uh, dynamics on which they are actually contesting that thing okay okay right so uh, are there any more queries because i think we have taken a lot of sirs sunday in fact the whole weekend <laughs> no worries uh, so i'm assuming if any more queries are there we can probably direct it to you on your email or students can reach out Perfect. to you Perfect. uh so at the end of this sir, i would on behalf of the entire placement assistance council and campus law center extend a huge thank you and gratitude to you once again for giving us your weekend and so very patiently handling the queries and taking us through this uh, entire model of mna and i'm pretty sure for those of us who had some experience a lot of creaks were filled because we must have had doubts in our practical experience for those of us who are trying to get into the mna environment it has given us a more structured framework to do, do our own homework to do our own readings and to be better informed and better read as we enter our professional journeys so i'm i'm assuming that regardless this would have been a very good session for both third years and the current first years to make up their minds and to proceed in a better manner and we hope to see you again so with the, any of the other topics that you suggest or that you feel could be beneficial to us no no definitely definitely you know i myself i am there to help out whatever doubts people have and whatever you have queries or you know follow on queries you can route it through the pack and you can please let me know and i'll be happy to help in whatever way possible right so thank you so much thanks. have a good weekend right whatever is the meaning of it <laughs> it was a very very fruitful and very rewarding weekend so all of us will feel less guilty at the end of it that we have uh, used it in a very productive manner to be sure thank you so, so much so thank you so much to everyone who joined it was very encouraging for us to see such numbers and we hope to host more such webinars and see you. good day everyone good day thank you thank you sir thank you thank you so much